If our children are the seeds and we are their gardeners, how we plant them and the way we tend to them will determine if they reach their full bloom. So we choose to listen to our intuition, focus on connection, and stay deeply rooted in order to make the most of every season in motherhood. We don't have all the answers and we probably never will. We are learning as they grow. This is our journey and by sharing our truths, we hope to encourage anyone along the way. Welcome to the Learning As They Grow podcast. Episode five of Learning As They Grow. I'm your host, Alicia Foster. I am going to be diving in today into the conversation of being a stay at home mom. I think that this is going to be actually unfolding into two parts as I kind of did my brain dump on paper and started thinking through everything that I wanted to talk about. I think I'm going to split this into a two part episode. So if you, um, have, are listening to this one, great. Stay tuned. There's going to be a part two next week. Uh, the first part is going to be about becoming a stay-at-home mom. A little bit of background on my story and how we made it happen and how it works for our family and the a little bit of adjustment period that was necessary for it. Part two next week will be about some misconceptions that may be out there for uh, stay-at-home mom life. It is going to be um, a way that maybe I take some negative comments that I've already heard in the last year or so, or misconceptions that people have said, and just turn it into a positive and explaining how we work around some of the things that happen in stay-at-home mom life. So stay tuned for that part. Today, we're going to be talking about just the beginning part, like I said. But before we get started with the episode, I'm going to start with my highs and my grows for the week. So my high this week is kind of a funny um, impromptu random spur of the moment event that happened for my daughter and I. So every, every day, pretty much, my daughter and I like to get outside. I like to get her in nature. I like to get her exposed to sunlight. And um, we just love being outside. So the other day we went, we started our morning with going on a walk through the woods near our house um, to a local pond or lake and had a great time. We got to see alligator um, swimming through and like was on top of the marsh, which was really cool. And my daughter was pointing at it and making lots of sounds. So that was a fun time. But then the afternoon came around and I was like, you know, I think we still need a little bit more outside time. And my daughter loves bike rides right now. So this is something that I can just say, should we go on a bike ride or do you want to go on a bike ride? And she will like dart towards the garage and start banging on it. I open it up and she goes to the bike and like is pointing. So she did that. And I'm like, all right, let's go. So sometimes we just go around the neighborhood, but I was feeling a little more adventurous today. So we loaded up the bike and I also needed to drop off some library books. So I planned to go to a nearby park that um, was by the library. So we went and they, my husband and I actually went walking through this trail when I was pregnant with Ellington and with our dogs and not knowing it was a bike trail. Um, had to like jump off the path because bikes were coming through. But I, I thought about it and I was like, oh, that was a fun trail in my mind. I remember just walking and it being a nice, you know, pretty trail that we walked through. So I thought, let's go ahead and check it out on the bike. So we start going. And as I enter, I see that it's a two mile trail and it's a one way. So there's no exiting. So I'm like, all right, let's go. This is fun. And there's a couple of little like bunny hills or bunny slopes, whatever it's called, where, you know, we had like little bouncing and it was fun. Um, And then all of a sudden we come up to these like huge man-made ramps that I'm like, okay, we're about to go down. We have never done something this intense on a bike ride with our girl attached. She, her seat is actually in the front. Um, It's between the person riding the bike and the handlebars. So she's like right there. I'm able to see her and know, you know, if she's doing good and stuff. And so I was like, all right, let's give this a try. And I, you know, go down the first one with a little bit of hesitation, slowly pumping my brakes, making sure that I was safe and everything was good. And then we kind of got some momentum and got more excited to keep on going. And we continue to hit these different man-made 
ramps. And at first I'm thinking, oh my goodness, is this, is this smart to do? Like, is she going to enjoy this? Is she scared? And all of a sudden she starts just laughing hysterically as I'm like going over these ramps and going around the curve. And it was just so, such a high for me to be able to see her just laughing and like having a blast. And I wish I had like a camera on the handlebars to be able to actually see her face, but I could kind of just see from the side and she was just loving it. So I think my girl is definitely going to be into roller coasters and a little bit of a daredevil one day, but it was a lot of fun. It was a blast. And I'm just so glad that when I had the flexibility to be able to go do that in the middle of the day with her, just like, Hey, let's go for a bike ride. But also I feel like God just kind of placed that in our day to be like, all right, let's do something a little bit more out of the ordinary. And it was the most amazing thing just to see her having so much fun. So, and don't worry anybody who's like, oh my goodness, those are not made for children. I got off of the bike a couple of times and made sure to just like walk up or walk down on the ramp just so that it was a little more safe. But I was being very cautious. And we, I mean, we were on the trail. There was, it was one way, there was no way of getting off. So we made the best of it and it was a great time. I don't know if I'll be doing it again, just because we went at a time that was kind of slower. So there weren't any other bikers and I was able to get off and go slow if needed. Um, but I, I saw afterwards, we were hanging out in the grass, watching people go on the trail. And there were a lot of um, advanced bikers or expert bikers that were coming around and you could tell that they probably take all those turns and ramps really fast so I was like all right maybe we'll find a different trail next time but it was just again it was a spur of the moment thing and it was the high of my week it was so much fun so that was my high now let's shift into my grow guys I think I shared this last week it has been a rough season for my family and I my little family um my husband me and our daughter Ellington and we know that this is just a season. So we're thankful for that. And we're trying to lean in on each other, lean in on God as needed. And just knowing that this is going to pass. We're going to be stronger on the other side of this. But I'm trying right now as a mom to just grow my knowledge of how to help my child in these hard times, but also how to adjust some of my thinking. So just a quick synopsis, I guess, of what's been so rough with this season regarding um, my daughter is her sleep has been really, really rough. Um, she's never, she's never slept through the night. So there's that for one. She's just always kind of been not a light sleeper. Like she can be passed out. The dogs can bark, the doorbell can ring and she'll be fine. But she will know if you're trying to like transfer her somewhere, she'll wake up. She's very, I feel like she has FOMO. Like she doesn't want to be left out. And she's like fear of missing out on what's going on outside of her room or outside of um, wherever she is sleeping at the time. So that's always been a thing with her. And we have just adjusted with what she's needed along the way. We tried bassinet for a while and that worked for periods of time. And then we co-slept for a bit. That was great for us, but it got to the point where she was not getting great sleep anymore. My husband was not getting great sleep anymore. And so we adjusted and put her into her room and made that transition. She did good with that for a little bit, still not sleeping through the night, still waking up twice, um, at least twice. Well, I'd say twice is pretty average of how often she wakes up. And, and I'm aware, I understand that she's no longer needing to wake up to feed for um, actual food. She's past that stage in her life. She's now 15 months old, but she is waking up for that comfort. And so that's something that I've just said, okay, I will be here for her in that moment. I will nurse and I will try to meet that need um, as long as she's needing it. But... I, we recently transferred her into a toddler bed because she was, um, it just seemed like she was not liking the being caged. And I had read a lot of parents saying that the toddler bed or floor bed really helps them, um, you know, with the autonomy of being able to regulate their sleep a little more. And this was great for about two weeks for us. We had watched her on the monitor and she would 
climb down from her bed and go read some books and then climb back up in her bed and fall asleep. Well, suddenly she got into this banging on the door where she's wanting us to come in. So it's been a big adjustment period for me to not respond immediately to her cries and learning about her that if I do go in, sometimes I'm making it worse. She is starting to um, want to then play and then she's overtired or she gets a little aggressive and just like thinks it's funny to hit me, which is not funny. Um, I try lay with her. I try rocking. I try nursing. I try all the comforting things that have always worked for her and it's not working right now. So I am having to do what I thought I would never do and let her cry a little bit on her own. And no shame for anybody who has done that or, you know, that works for y'all or you felt that that's what you needed to do to give your child the best sleep. But it just, for me, never felt like something that settled right whenever, you know, I experienced it with my child. And so it's been hard saying, oh my goodness, she is crying. She is needing me. But having to be reminded that she is in a safe place. She has all of her um, physical needs met. And I can go back in there periodically to attend to her emotional needs and just trying to tell her like, it is bedtime. This is time for you to lay down. I love you so much. I'm going to be right outside of the door or I'm going to be right in the other room. I will be back soon, but you need to try to go to sleep. And we give her maybe two to three minutes. Um, and, and it's been interesting to watch that she will throw a full on fit, but then turn around and go and lay down. And right now she's laying down on her rug, which kind of makes me feel bad, but she's getting the same amount of sleep that she was on a bed. She seems equally as comfortable. So I'm letting it happen. Um, I've tried picking her up and transferring her into bed. And I, again, it made it worse. So I'm having to just sit back and go, oh my goodness, she just did it on her own after two or three minutes of crying. And that is not something that I thought I was going to do with her, but it's unfortunately we were at a loss, comforting her, laying with her, nursing her. That was all not working to get her to fall asleep. And so I had to let her do it on her own. And so that's been a rough time. Like I come out of the room and I just feel defeated hearing her cry. I cry into my husband's shoulder and just like, I hate hearing her cry. And then all of a sudden I hear her stop crying and we look on the monitor and she's like asleep curled up and she's totally fine. Um, and this isn't every single night. Some nights she lets me lay her down in bed, lets me read her a book and I can walk out and then she'll follow, but then she'll go back and she'll be good. Some nights she doesn't, the two, three minutes doesn't work. And I have to go back in there. And then I'm like, okay, I'm going to just lay down with you again. You're overtired. Let's adjust and figure out what, what you need. But that has been a big grow for me. And my husband too, we're like already talking like, okay, with the next one, do we need to do sleep training? Do we need to stick with post-sleeping? Like, what do we need to do? And I don't know. I don't know the answer. So I, you know, I'm here to just be raw and say like, I am not an expert. This is the purpose of this whole podcast is to share my learning experience along the way. I am not here to say, do it this way, do it that way. Don't do it this way. I'm, I, all I do is I follow my child's cues. I look into things. I reach out to other parents. I read a lot of articles, listen to a lot of podcasts, look at research and data and things. And I just do the best that I can do for her in this time. So that's, that's where we're at right now. I wanted to share that with y'all. And again, like I said last week, if y'all can just pray for my family and I, that this season does pass and everything is getting um, to where it needs to be for her to get better sleep and for her to know that, you know, she's loved and all of that. So, all right, that's my grow. Now let's move into the episode regarding becoming a stay-at-home mom. This is something that I am now just completely on the other side, maybe of where I once was. Not that I ever was against being a stay-at-home mom, but I just didn't know that God had this plan in store for me. So in this first part of the episode about becoming a stay-at-home mom, I'm going to have like three little subtopics. My first one is going to be a little bit of background on my story, how we got to this um, decision as a family, 
And then I'm going to break it down into how we made it happen. I've had um, some mom friends reach out and just say, you know, they're feeling a certain way and wanting to be home with their child. They don't feel that they can do it financially or mentally or whatever it may be. And just asking how we did it. So I want to share a little bit about that. And then the last part is going to be kind of brief, but about adjusting to being a stay-at-home mom and what that looks like for me in the beginning time, how, how I did that, how I'm still doing that and figuring stuff out. So quick sip of water, and then I'm going to jump into my story of how we came to this. Hydration, so important. I think I say this in every episode. Um, okay, so let me start by giving a little bit of background on my past life, who I was before truly finding God in my life. I've always been a Christian, but I don't think I had that relational aspect that is crucial to real Christianity and really having um, a, a relationship with God. So prior to that and prior to finding my husband and um, how he's transformed my life too, I lived a life um, that I look back on now and I just see so many empty holes that I was trying to fill. I um, was a, at the time, my career, uh, career, my job was a bartender and a student. I was a student for about 10 years trying to get through college, trying to figure out what I was doing. And I bartended, worked in restaurants. Um, and I always had side hustles. Like I um, babysat or I worked at a hair salon and like swept up hair at one point. I worked at a um, nursing home for a little bit in the, the night shift. That was a whole, you know, experience in itself. So I've always had at least two jobs. Um, and I've just always been a work ethic motivated person that kind of runs deep in my family line. I come from a long line of people who are very passionate about their work. They work really hard. Um, type A type people who are proud of their organization and their managing skills. And I, you know, have that same kind of knack in me, I guess, whenever I uh, worked, whether it was working at a restaurant or a bar or working as a teacher, which is what once I graduated, I was a teacher for five years in elementary schools. So I've always kind of just had that in me where I'm like, I can't just do the bare minimum. I like to put in my full effort. I like things to be as per close to perfect. Not really. I, I understand things can't be perfect, but I, I like to present things that I am proud of when it came to my work. So I've always been that kind of person. And with that being said, I never imagined myself not working. Even when becoming pregnant and talking with my husband about possibly um, spending more time with my daughter and less time at work, um, I still imagined myself doing something part-time. But here I am now, and I am, I am so happy to say I do not have a full-time job. I don't even really have a part-time job. I do things now that I am passionate about, and that bring me joy just for the fun of it. And if I make a little money off of it, then it's a perk. So I tutor because I have a passion for teaching. That was something that I wanted to continue doing. And so I tutor two students right now, and I had opportunities to tutor many more students, but I didn't want my schedule to get too bogged down. So I just do that now to kind of fuel that passion and continue to enjoy that. And um, obviously I'm able to put time into this kind of uh, passion as well of sharing things that I'm learning about motherhood along the way. So this is a new world to me. I really just did not ever think that this would be what God had in store for me. I was not one of the moms that was like, or the women growing up that was like, oh, I just can't wait to be a stay-at-home mom. I just can't wait to not have to work or, you know, whatever it may be that, that really wasn't me. And so I want to share that because I feel like 
a lot of times people think that women who are stay-at-home moms, that's kind of just always been your dream and you've just always wanted to be a mom. And sometimes people see it like, well, I have other dreams in my life too. And I'm here to say I did and I do too. Being a mom has fulfilled me the most in my life thus far, but I do still have other passions that I'm able to pursue. I just personally right now am enjoying being able to put majority of my time into mothering. So whether you are somebody who has always wanted to be a stay-at-home mom and you're looking forward to that season of your life, or if you're a working mom and you're like, no, I'm never going to be able to be there hear me out and listen to how God really changed my life and opening my eyes to this whole world. And I'm so thankful for it. And I really do feel that he, God was preparing me for this season of my life. So as I was saying, I, whenever I was going through college, I was working different jobs. I didn't know that I wanted to even be a teacher at the time. I've always enjoyed being around kids and that I've been told that, you know, I have a knack for talking with kids and teaching and stuff. But it was just a side hustle of mine, again, to try to work through college. I started teaching dance, gymnastics, and cheerleading. I started nannying or babysitting on the side. And um, it was really kind of just happening in my life. And I wasn't sure where it was going to go. And then come to find out, I was really passionate about teaching. So I went down that career path. Um, Not to say that you know, you have to be somebody that's passionate about being with children or teaching your child in order to be stay at home. But that was the journey that God laid out for me. So now moving into how we made this happen, because like I said, I've had people, friends and strangers reach out since I've been a stay at home mom and said, how are you able to do it financially or mentally? And I guess regarding the mental aspect of it, I think it is important to make sure that you still have passion in other things. Like I said, I'm enjoying doing this. This kind of gives me something to put my time into, but I'm also doing tutoring, which has nothing to do with being a mother. Um, And then I also make time for dates with my husband or me time. I lean in on um, a babysitter friend down the street or a family member who can give me some of those breaks if needed. So emotionally, there are some times that you do have to adjust and say, okay, I need to still feel my passions as well. And so that is how I've done that. Now, financially, this is a big one that I think is important to talk about because people know that it's going to take sacrifices, but they're not always willing to make those sacrifices. So for us, um, we set up a budget and we had initially intended on living off of the one salary that my husband was making at the time of me um, being pregnant. I had two months left to finish out my teaching after I had my daughter where she was able to stay with family during that time. And then my summer came and I was able to put in my resignation and knew that we would be, I would be home with her after that. And so we had just, you know, started looking at our budget, started talking about, okay, this is going to be now where we're at. How are we going to make this happen? Um, We are currently living in a house that is smaller than a lot of our friends do live in. And that's totally fine for us. We do have dreams one day of a bigger house, more space, but more so we have dreams of having land and being a little more out of the city area. So that's something that we're saving towards and looking forward towards in the future. But right now, having a big house is not necessity for us. Um, We also, you know, we paid off our cars. Uh, My husband had bought his car when he was like 22, I think, and he was able to pay that off. And I had a cash car that I drove for a while. And then uh, when the time came for me to need a new car, I drove my husband's car as he was fortunate to get a work truck that we had for a while. And then when he switched jobs and had to give up that work truck, we had again, another fork in the road to go, okay, yes, I would love to buy a brand new car or even a used one, but I instead um, decided to 
take my grandma's car who, when she had passed away, she left the car that she had um, with the family. And it's about 12 years old, I think. Um, and it has about 200,000 miles on it. The, there's a sound going on with the radio that I've literally learned to just tune out at this time. And the window, I have to tape the window up. So it's not, you know, what I would dream of, but it's the sacrifice that I'm making right now because we do, we are able to save towards our future. And, um, we just, we're choosing to live below our means now. So we had planned to live with what my husband was currently making and made those sacrifices and just said, it's going to be tight and we're going to make it work for us. It was worth it. Um, but we were fortunate right as my teaching paychecks ended, God provided my husband with a new job and we were able to, he was able to make a little bit more. And instead of us saying, wow, we're making a lot more now. Let's go buy that new car and let's go buy that new house. We've been saving and saving and saving for our future. And just knowing that we're still living on one income and just living below our means has been something, a sacrifice that we have chosen to make for this season of our life. So that I think is a huge thing. And a lot of people um, say, well, we can't, you know, we've looked at the numbers and we just can't do it. And I just would advise to look at the numbers again. And you might have some ties to payments, like a big house that you already have, or um, a car that you just love. And you're like, well, I have $500 for this car every month I have to pay. And we have a, you know, X amount mortgage that I have to pay. But if it's something that you are wanting to do, you will find a way. So look at those numbers, see if there's any wiggle room, see if you can make choices to live below your means. Um, if that's something that you need to do in order to make this happen. Some people are fortunate enough to where you don't have to make cuts at all. And that is amazing. That's great. But a lot of times I do understand that that is not the case for most families. And so I think it is, there's something to be said though, about understanding that majority of the time where there's a will, there's a way. Now, of course, I understand that there are single parents out there and you don't have the option of an income some, coming somewhere else. Or there are families out there that both are working as hard as they possibly can and getting the jobs that they are able to get right now. And between even both of the incomes, you are barely making ends meet. So I understand that there are situations, but what I'm talking about is your average person who will say to me like, oh, that's nice that you're able to do that, but we just can't. I wish I could, but we can't. And I look at some of the lifestyles and I say, wow, that's a nice house you have, or that's a nice car that you have, or that's nice that you're able to go on these trips or do this and that. And if that is important for your family to have all those things, by all means, do you have that? No judgment at all. But just saying the term like, I wish we could, but we can't, I think needs to be looked at and understanding that I wish we could have X, Y, and Z, but we are choosing not to. Because for us, the time home with my daughter right now is worth every penny that we're not making from my income. So that's my little spiel about how we financially did it. Um, and if it's something that you're interested in, like I said, talk with your spouse, look at your budget where there's a will. A lot of times there's a way. Um, so the how we did it is pretty simple and straightforward. If you really look at it, you can write it down on paper and you can plan it out. And um, for the most part, I think a big part of how we did it is also trusting in God and turning to him in prayer. And he provided in every sense of the way, every time that we were like, okay, we're going to make these sacrifices. However, that may be, he provided some way for us. And instead of us looking at like, oh, I have to have this car that may not be great. We saw, wow, God provided us with a opportunity to have a car. Or instead of saying, oh, man, I have to have you know, this situation or be stuck in this house. We said, wow, God's providing us with a house that we are able to have paid and be able to put money now towards our future home right before the big, um, you know, 
price increase that's been happening in the economy, especially with houses right now, we were able to get that house right before. So there's a lot of ways that God provided and we're able to look at it in positive light and see that he is providing for us. Um, and so the how can be simple. However, your biggest part is going to need to be your why. My why might be different than your why. And I think it's important to look at your why no matter what choice you're making in life, whether you're choosing to you know, be a working mom or dad, if you're choosing to go to school and work towards certain careers, um, what is your why for why is that important for you? If you're choosing to stay at home, why? What is the why? So think about that for you and your family. For us, before we even had my daughter, my husband and I just would have some deep conversations and we started looking at society and the way we feel things have kind of changed from how we think God intended um, the world to be. And it, it's really sad, honestly. Now, not saying every single family is like this. I think a lot of people try to stay true to um you know, being a little more in tune with God's intention for the family unit. But some of us get very lost in this world. And it is something that my husband and I made very clear before having kids that we wanted to try to be intentional about avoiding some of the things that are of this world for our family. We want to separate ourselves from it. We're going to teach our children about all the craziness in the world, but we want to keep their innocence for as long as possible. And we want to be able to show them the beauty in the way God intended the world to be for a family. And for us, the more we talked about it, the more God put this on our heart. And my heart had to open a lot because I was always, like I said, a very independent woman who was just like, I can do this on my own. I don't need a man. And I kind of fell into the, I think, common day feminism views. But as I started to look at it, especially in the context of the Bible, and my husband and I started talking, I realized that there actually isn't um, this negative darkness that is um, in the idea of submitting yourself for your husband or for your family and wanting to be a provider in the way of nurturing and being a homemaker and things like that. The society that, you know, I had been in and seen really made all of that seem so negative and oppressive. And it actually is not. Now that I'm in it, I'm realizing not, I'm not just submitting to my husband. He's not sitting with his feet up on the couch saying, give me this woman. He is submitting to me and our child as well and being able to provide in his own way too. So we both are working towards this view of what we think that God intended for a husband and wife to be. So this was my why that I feel God placed on our hearts right before having our daughter. And now that we've had her, it feels even more like this is where I'm supposed to be. Um, is every moment of the day just rainbows and butterflies? Absolutely not. Just like any other parent out there, there are the great times and there are the hard times for sure, especially because I am with her pretty much 24-7. Um, but the good times definitely get to outweigh the hard times for us. And I just can't imagine missing out on all of that now. Um, my daughter is now 15 months old, as I've mentioned many times before, and I've spent almost every day of her life with her, and I just still feel like it's going by so quickly. And any parent I know always tells me the days are long, but the years are short, and that is so true, but it would be even more true if I was splitting my time right now with a job. So something that I did to kind of make it make even more sense for me, um, even though I already felt my why of why I wanted to stay home, but just being able to justify it numerically and be able to put it into um, numbers for people and being able to say, hey, this is the facts of how much time you're going to be away from your child if you are working. That kind of helped me see it. So I want to break this down for you. So I did the math as if it was regular full-time job, um, 40 hours a week, seven days, or yeah, 40 hours a week, seven days a week. And multiply this times 52 weeks in the year and came out to that being an average of being away from your child uh, for a little bit over 2,000 hours a year. If you do the math on how many hours are in a year, there are only 
8,736 hours in a year. So if you look at it like that, if I was to be working, I would be missing a fourth of my child's life in just one year, a fourth of it. Um, and so this to me was huge to be able to understand a fourth in just a year is a big deal. Everyone knows three months is a lot of time in that first year, especially a lot happens in three months. Guys, 18 and years with her, you break it up over there to our child four and a half of those years, years over that that's whole time. four and a half years that I would be away in total um, if I was to be working. And this is not including sleeping. So if you were to do the math for your family, uh, the sleep hours, your work hours, you look at it and you might actually come to an even lower number of hours that you get together because of working. So for me, I looked at it and just said, I'm only going to get 18 years truly for this baby of mine to be with me, learn from me, um, grow. I'm going to grow so much because of everything that I'm getting to do with her too, and just really enjoy this beauty of parenthood. And if I'm going to be giving up four and a half years of that, that wasn't a sacrifice that I was wanting to make. So we talked about the sacrifices on the side of becoming a stay-at-home mom and how that is mostly a financial sacrifice and understanding that there is a sacrifice too on the other side. Again, nothing wrong. If that is the path for you, that's totally fine. Um, no judgment. It's your family. It's your life. I just want to put out some facts there for people who might be curious about it. I know a lot of people who are saying, I feel like I'm away from my child so much. Well, let's look at it. You're away from them for a fourth of their time in that first year. That is, that is a lot. Okay, so last thing I want to share is just a quick understanding of becoming a stay-at-home mom does not always come natural. I'm going to have a part two, as I said, that goes over some misconceptions that I've heard from people. And I'll dive more into this then, but I wanted to just say part of becoming a stay-at-home mom is adjusting your mindset and understanding that your day-to-day -day is not going to look the same as it probably ever has before. And it's going to look different in that first year than it does to whenever they're four years old or 10 years old or whatever it may be. And it's definitely going to look different when you have multiple children. So understanding that there's going to be adjustment periods, just as there is with anything. Um, something that was huge for me is choosing to be intentional with every day. At first, I'm like, woo, I've got all this free time. But that was in that fourth trimester when my little baby would just sleep in my arms and we could just cuddle up on the couch. But then you can fall into a time when you're like, okay, I'm, I'm a little depressed now. I'm sitting around all the time. Like, this isn't the life for me. But instead, being intentional, even in that early stage of saying, we need to get outside. We're going to go for a walk today or I'm going to meet up with a friend or a family member, or I'm going to do something for me during her nap time or whatever that may be, um, being intentional, even in the early stages so that you don't fall into that negative feeling of what stay at home mom life can be. Um, setting up a little bit of a routine can be helpful. And the best part is being able to have the flexibility of your routine. You're able to work your days around you and your child's life. So you know, setting up routine, but flexibility. And that's where I'm going to stop it there. I will dive more into all of this in the part two. I would love to go into um, one day sharing with you the kind of routine and schedule that we do have that has worked for us. If that's something you're interested about, stay tuned for that. So again, this whole episode is not to make anybody feel any type of way if being a working mom is what you're either having to do or choosing to do. But I just wanted to share my truths and what has worked for my family and I and how we came to some of the decisions we made and how it really has been the best thing that we've ever done in our lives. And I am so thankful that I am able to 
have this life of being a stay-at-home mom now. So I wanted to share with that with y'all. I hope that you feel encouraged from this or at least just say, hey, good for her. That, that works great. Um, and, and not take it in any type of way. But of course, if you feel any type of way about it, always feel free to reach out to me. Even if you're just like, wow, that actually helped me understand how to make some changes in my life, reach out to me. I'd love to hear from you. All right, stay tuned for part two of Learning As They Grow. I'm Alicia Foster. Have a beautiful week.